Today we're going to talk about Islamic art, which is the last of our three religions of the book. Last week we talked about Jewish, early Christian, and Byzantine art, and it's all running into the medieval period and early medieval, and the medieval art is actually our subject next. And Islamic art is kind of an interesting animal because it's going to take us from the inception of Islam all the way through the 16th century. And I want you to have this brief overview of where it fits because Islamic influences are extremely important throughout the development of Western art, history, and literature, actually in, actually in many different ways. That's why this slide says, Islamic art, 7th to 16th centuries, because what I talk about is going to kind of span loosely those time periods. Even though this is Art History Survey 1, which technically ends in the 12th century, Islamic art, we may move ahead of that a little bit. So, this rapid expansion of Islam it was a light, it was like a lightning bolt. It, it just, it did not take it long, just several decades before it completely changed the Western world. So I just want to tell you a little bit about it. The word itself, Islam, actually means submission to the will of Allah. And Allah is the word that Muslims use for God. The word Muslim means those who have submitted. So it's correct to say that Muslims practice Islam. Islam is the religion itself and Muslims are the people. It's a monotheistic religion. So they have one God and it grew out of Judaism and Christianity. It has the same text as the Old Testament. The Christian has the Christian Old Testament. The Quran is very similar to the Talmud, and all three are different yet similar versions of the book and writings. And originally it just completely dispensed with the priesthood. Sacraments, liturgy, and every Muslim had direct access to Allah or to God right through prayer. So it was a direct religion for the common people. It was founded by a person. His name was Muhammad, and he was he lived from 570 to 632. But so he he died um, roughly 10 years after the religion was founded, and he was born in Mecca, and that's one reason why Islamic or Muslims travel to Mecca as part of their religion. It's a religious pilgrimage. Muhammad's father was a merchant, and he traded. So they went all the way through Byzantium, Persia, China, India. So that's one reason why Islam spread so fast, because ideas travel where there's trade. And originally, it originated in Arabia in the early 7th century. We've already done some talking about ways in which the world is expanding, and we've seen some rising and falling of empires, of course. So by the 7th century CE, which is when Islam was born, the political climate in the Western world is very complex, and you know a little bit about it already. We know about the Byzantine Empire. It's one of the most powerful empires in the known world by that time, and it's controlling most of Europe and most of the Holy Land. So Muhammad comes into this picture, and he founds Islam in 622, as I've said, and it spread exponentially all the way through Africa, through Europe, through Asia, to India, North Africa, to within 100 miles of France. And even today, it's the fast, most fastest growing religion in the world. And again, he was born in Mecca. Muslims believe that the house that Abraham built for God, which is called the Kaaba, is in Mecca. And Mecca is the Muslim holy city. So, by 632, it spread across the Arabian Peninsula. These next few slides are going to be some maps. So you can see Saudi Arabia down here. And then by 661, into parts of North Africa and into Persia. 
and by 750 all the way into Spain in the west and into the Indus Valley, which today is Pakistan, in the east. So today it's actually the second largest religion in the world behind Christianity. And this map is color-coded so you can see the different places where Islam had spread. Here's a bigger version of it for you to see. And some of these are older names for the countries. I have a couple more maps so you can kind of superimpose countries from today to get some idea, just because the Middle East is very much in the news right now and has been for the past, you know, throughout most of the 20th century. But you can really see why when you think about these three religions that grow, that sort of come together and grow together and the controversy between them. Here's sort of a more simplified map and you can see the Mediterranean Sea and um, this, this little inset is actually cuts out Spain. Spain, Man, Umayyad Spain, it's actually over here. And I think this next map, yes, yeah, so here is today. So Persia has become Iran. Here's Pakistan over here, which would be the Indus Valley. When we studied the art of the ancient Near East, we were looking at Anatolia up here. It's is, is modern day Turkey. Here's Syria um, and Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. So this kind of helps you get an idea where a lot of these places are. And we're going to see the spread of Islamic art all the way through Pakistan and into India, up here in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan with the Timurs. All right, so just so you understand what the religion is, and this helps you understand their architecture when we get to that, it's very simple, very easy to understand direct relationships with God, there's no need for an intercessor. So in the Christian religion at the time, most people, of course, couldn't read. And often they didn't even understand the words in a liturgical service. And the services were extremely complex, full of panoply, beautiful robes, all sorts of trappings, incense, the host and the wine was a very elaborate ritual with many, many steps to it. And there, was, there were many layers between the common worshiper and access to God. So in the Islamic religion, all of that is pretty much done away with. Here are the five pillars of Islam. So these are the things that you would do to be a good Muslim. And this is still the same today. You believe there's no God but God. You don't believe that Muhammad is God or divine or anything like that. So where many Christians believe that Jesus Christ is actually God, there's different, there's different ways of talking about Christ's divinity, and we've talked about some of those. With Islam, Muhammad has no divinity at all. He is a messenger. So Allah is the only God. You pray five times a day, and you have, you have a mat, and you're, or you just go onto the ground, but you know it's nice if you have a prayer mat, which oftentimes will have calligraphy on it, you know, the many Islamic carpets have calligraphy or even designs of mihrabs, which are niches in a mosque. And you, you face a certain way when you pray, you, you face toward Mecca when you pray. You give alms, they call it zakah. During the month of Ramadan, you fast, and at least once in your lifetime, you, do, you go on a hajj which is a pilgrimage to Mecca. So at least once in your life, you need to go to Mecca. If you do those five things, you are a good Muslim. So here is, just to give you an idea, this is an image of Prophet Muhammad and his companions traveling to the fair. And it's actually, if you look at the date, this is a much later manuscript. This is from 1594. But it's a good illustration of the way Muslim artists depict their religion, depict their stories. This is a book. Now, you would not find an image like this 
in a mosque or anything like that because they don't believe in imagery in a mosque. And that has taken the form of iconoclasm in, in today's world. We've talked about that in the last lecture. But they do make stories about Muhammad and, and his life, and that's what this, this book is. But when they illustrate him, you notice this white figure is just outlined. It's not really filled in. So it's like a place marker for Muhammad. We don't really see his face. We do see the face of his companion behind him. He's traveling, um, he's traveling with, with two people. And so the story of Muhammad is that God revealed a message to an, the angel Gabriel. So they have the angel Gabriel too. And Gabriel transmitted this message to Muhammad. And then these revelations from God were the basis of Islam. So the believers submit to God, but then they acknowledge Muhammad as God's prophet. If you're a Muslim believer, you would submit to God and you acknowledge Muhammad as God's prophet but not as God. They do recognize other prophets. They recognize Jesus and similar to Christians, they also believe in one God. The other figures in here are Abu Bakr and Ali, and they're all going together on a camel to a desert market fair. And this is interesting because it explains a little bit the way in which Muhammad proselytized his religion. He's going to see his uncle to get his uncle's support for this new religion, and he's looking for converts. There'll be people at the fair that he can convert to Islam as well. So I just want to talk about a couple of art forms, Islamic art forms. And so one of the most important art forms is calligraphy. And calligraphy is seen in their tile work, in their decorative arts, as we see here, and in objects to create the art. So this is a pen box. It's actually from Persia in the 11th century. It's made out of brass, silver, and copper, and some other black material, maybe some kind of wood or something like that. We don't know. All cultures value different types of art to a greater or lesser degree. And there's different kinds of emphasis depending on what the focus is. So in Christian art, sculpture became one of the highest art forms after architecture, and architecture was one of the highest art forms as well. Much of this coming out of the philosophy of people like Aristotle who decreed that there was actually a hierarchy of art forms. In addition, one of the earliest ways that Christians spread their religion and talked about it was through visual illustrations of the stories in the Bible. So we saw that in art from the catacombs, things like that. Stories of Jesus, stories of Jesus' deeds are central to the Christian religion, that the New Testament becomes the basis for this new religion. Now, interestingly, both Judaism and Islam focus on the Old Testament stories in, in differing ways. Although, as we've seen, the Jewish art, they do have some imagery for storytelling. It's not that they, you know, worship the people in the images, but they learn about God. So it's, it is also, like Islam, a religion of learning. But they don't put an emphasis on the act of writing itself. That is unique to Islam. But the other thing that's interesting about that is calligraphy also is an art form in China, in Japan, and has been for centuries. So whether or not there's some connection there is an interesting thing to think about because certainly Islam isn't the only place where we see development of calligraphy, although it is the only place where the actual calligraphy itself, the actual words from their religious document, from the Quran, are the decoration itself in the temple. So when we see calligraphy in Chinese and Japanese 
manuscripts, it's often valued as an art form, but not necessarily as part of a church. So they used their writing to adorn surfaces from walls of buildings, brass candlesticks, textiles, glassware, and I'll show you a couple of those. It becomes very, very intricate, and they have different kinds of script for different things as well. We actually have two kinds of script on this particular pen box. One's called Kufic and one's called Nashki. This is a late 19th century lacquer Persian pen box. So again, another art object. So one of the hallmarks of Islamic art is this integration of work, worship, of writing, and of learning. So for this reason, these kinds of objects, pen boxes, inkwells, things like this, are treated with all the ceremony and reverence that we see in any religious object. So at first, early Islamic art did reflect local traditions in art and architecture. So we see some Roman forms, some Byzantine forms, and some Persian forms. We'll see this. We saw the Persian forms in, in some of these pen boxes, for example. We will see Roman architecture inside the Dome of the Rock in a few minutes. But as the religion spreads and becomes more refined, they do develop their own type of architecture and art form. And they develop a vocabulary of non-figural ornaments. So they have different kinds of geometric designs, all sorts of scrolling vines. So this script it morphs into designs, calligraphic swirls, complex patterns that only somebody that can understand how to read it very, very well would be able to decipher. So it's abstraction. So this idea is that abstraction will free the mind from material form, and thus they can allow contact with the divine presence. So there's a degree of meditative worship in this. Here's a very, very, very early script. This is the time of the early caliphates, which were the, the caliphs that were beginning Islam directly after Muhammad died. And this is a page from the Quran. It's in Kufic script, probably from Syria or Iraq. We're not sure. And it was made in the ninth century, so 200 years after Islam was founded. It's made out of ink and pigments and gold on vellum, which vellum is a very fine parchment. So it's this reverence for the Quran as the word of God, that the act of writing, this act of calligraphy is an act of worship. And we see these red diacritical marks here and there. They're accenting this dark brown ink, like right here, right here. So Islamic art is aniconic. That's the, there's a word for you. It's aniconic is a symbolic representation and there are no images of human figures. Most Islamic art is mostly inscriptions from the Quran, and as we've said, the act of transcribing the Quran is a holy act. So the word calligraphy literally means beautiful handwriting. So once they have transcribed these words, this piece of vellum is transformed into a holy object simply by the act of putting pen to paper to, or in this case, develop. They also use abstract patterns and designs to emphasize the immateriality of God. So if there's pure color that can free the viewer's mind from the contemplation of material form, it's, if you look at this and only meditate on the forms and the shapes of the letters themselves, you can open up to this divine presence of God. Here's some Kufic script on a bowl that so you can see the Kufic border around it. And so this bowl itself becomes a sacred object, again, by the act of putting the letters on it. This is known as Samarkand ware, and the inscription is about the value of knowledge. Now, this is the Kaaba 
in Mecca. So if you go on your pilgrimage, you're going to go to Mecca and you're going to go here to this great big giant black square box of a building. You can see all the people around it, how small they are. You can see them all walking around. And so when Muhammad came and conquered, this was a place where Arabs came together to trade. And the Arabs, they would put their idols there on the, by this Kaaba. But Muhammad reached, Muhammad, uh, okay. so this was used long before Muhammad. It was used as a trade center and a place where there were all these Arabian tribes and they were shamans and they had idols and they had an animistic, very, very vibrant animistic tradition. So when Muhammad came into the picture, he's, he said, no, this is not the way we're going to worship. Now, the merchants in Mecca were very rich. These are, some of them are Bedouin traders. They're people that, they're tribes that have been trading in the desert for centuries. They have caravans. They're, it's a long established culture. So when Muhammad came to Mecca, they didn't want him there. They were very comfortable with the culture that they had. But in 630, Muhammad built up a following outside Mecca and he came and conquered. He destroyed the idols, he broke the tribal ties, but he did an unusual thing for the time which was that he spared the people. He didn't just rape and pillage and chop everyone's head off and kill their children. He spared everyone. He said, you know, convert to this new, that you're, this is not the way you need to follow God in this way. And this won their respect. And Muhammad could see how under the old regime, there was a disparity between rich and poor. And Islam, one big thing about it is it just completely dispenses with a class system. Everybody is equal under the eyes of Allah. So the masses gravitated to these ideas. As we've seen, the fifth pillar of Islam requires every able Muslim to take a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in your lifetime. That's because it's associated with Abraham and they believe that the Kaaba is the house erected to God by Abraham. And this Kaaba is where you would turn to pray five times a day. You're praying to this box, to this Kaaba. So when you get to Mecca, you come here and then you circumambulate, you walk around the Kaaba counterclockwise. Why? Because you're undoing time. You're counteracting it, you're stopping time. The idea is that humans have created time. Before humanity, there was the universe. Before the universe, there was God. God is and was and always shall be. And he is now, he is past, he is present. He is future. So if you circumambulate backwards, backwards to the clock, you are undoing time and you are becoming one with this continuity of universe. So Muhammad died in Medina in 632. And this is just a very brief sketch there's you can find if you're interested in this subject you can find a lot of information about it but it's it's kind of important in just in terms of the art that we're going to see with later tribes that the early caliphates that we just looked at that kufic script that's these umar uthman and ali this warrior and they they ruled first one 634 then the next 10 years uthman and then ali who rule from 656 to 661. And what eventually ended up happening is that we, they ended up with divisions in Islam. There was a schism. And so 
this was the seeds of the divisions between Sunni and Shia that we see today. The Sunnis recognized Abu Bakr as the rightful leader of Islam. And Abu Bakr was Muhammad's friend and his father-in-law, and he was the leader, or he was the ruler at the time. So they, they tied their religion to a caliph or to a ruler. And so that the second ruler, of course, was Umar, the third one was Uthman. But the fourth caliph was Ali. Ali was a warrior, and he was Muhammad's son-in-law. And the Shiites say that Ali is the rightful reader, leader, reader. Ali is the, the rightful leader. And both divisions have their own reasons for saying one or the other, and there are many other reasons for the division as well, but this is sort of the seed of it. And there is also, as in most religions, there is a mystical form of Islam that ad advocates asceticism. You could parallel it to Christian monks or to Benedictine monks. They have ascetic practices, intense love of God, and the Sufism developed in the 8th century in Persia. So we had them in the mix too. So here is our first Islamic architecture. This is called the Dome of the Rock, and it stands today. It's in Jerusalem in Israel. And so early Muslims built shrines and, and mosques, which is the word for an Islamic church, and palaces. And in their early phases, they're inspired by Byzantine architecture. You know, think of the Hagia Sophia, for example. Now, Jerusalem is the holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. The Haram al-Sharif, which the Jewish call it the Temple Mount, and the Muslims identify it as the place where Muhammad ascended to the presence of God. Also, the Christians associate this rock with the creation of Adam, and it's the place where Abraham prepared to sacrifice Isaac and the site of the Temple of Solomon which is so this one rock that this dome is built on is given all of these claims to fame from the Old Testament. And so it is sacred to Jews, to Christians, and Muslims. But this church was built as an Islamic church, although all three religions see it as a sacred site. And this particular building is the oldest surviving Islamic building in existence today. Here's an aerial view of it. So you can see right here in the middle, here's Jerusalem, of course, that, you know, modern Jerusalem is just sprawling, right? So in 631, Caliph Omar I captured Jerusalem. And you remember Titus when we studied the Roman Empire sacking the temple? When, you know, he destroyed it and he took away the, the menorah and he took away the Ark of the Covenant. We have those images on the inside of the Arch of Titus. Well, that site, Omar I erected a square shrine of bricks and wood because he just wanted to encase the rock that Abraham tried to sacrifice his son Isaac on because it was a sacred Islamic site. So originally he just wanted to protect this rock, so he built the square around it. But toward the end of the seventh century, we had the second caliph, Abul al-Madlik, who put this dome right over it. This is a cutaway drawing. So if you recall, as we look at architecture, if we want to see kind of how it is inside, we might just imagine that we sliced it with a lemon slicer right down the middle so we can see inside. So we see this centralized octagonal plan, which we've seen in both Byzantine architecture and it's there in local Christian architecture as well. The Islamic architects use very complex math. They don't use the type of math that Christians are using with sevens and threes. They don't have a trinity. They use an eight-pointed star with two intersecting squares. This is a special shrine. So it's, it's not a mosque. It's not a church meant for special, regular public worship. So it doesn't have what we're going to see a little bit later, the mihrab or the qibla wall or any of those things. This is a shrine placed around a sacred place. 
Here's the inside of it. So again, look at these Roman forms. We see Roman arches and columns. It looks like the inside of these early Byzantine churches, but the interior is decorated with a frieze all the way around it, which is containing the earliest written text of the Quran. So the whole written text of the Quran is inside this building. And inside the whole central space, we have a dome way up on a tall drum and then this arcade of columns and then two concentric aisles that enclose the actual rock. So now I wanna show you a mosque. So we're going to look at a very simple mosque first. This is called the mosque at Kairan. All mosques are oriented toward Mecca and the wall that is, the wall that goes toward Mecca is called the Qibla. And when worshipers go into the mosque, they get arranged themselves in rows so they can pray facing Mecca. Generally, the faithful will gather for Friday prayers. There'll often be a sermon in the principal mosque of the city. So in this case, it's called the Great Mosque or something that's called Friday Mosque. There is a Friday Mosque as well. This particular one from Kairawan is reflecting Muhammad's house. And it's in the earliest, simplest form of a mosque, which is why we're looking at it first. It's a hypostyle hall, which surrounds an open courtyard. So you saw a hypostyle hall in Egyptian art, and this is the same thing. There's rows of very closely spaced columns, and they're all perpendicular rows to the Qibla wall, and then they all support a flat roof. And the Qibla, of course, is the mosque wall oriented toward Mecca, as indicated by the mihrab. Mihrabs are recesses that distinguish the Qibla wall. So that sounds like a lot of words, but we're gonna look at it. Here's a aerial view of this great mosque. This particular one is in Kiruan in Tunisia. Here's a minaret and there's a man called the Muezzin who stands up here and, and calls the Islamic faithful to prayer. Later mosques often have four minarets, one on each side, but this one just has one. Here is the hypostyle hall is underneath this flat roof. Here's the open courtyard right here where they gather. These are mihrabs, these little these little arches, and those show, tell you that this wall is oriented toward Mecca. So the earliest mosques are hypostyle halls that surround open courtyards, as we've seen. So this is a plan, this is actually the plan of the great mosque in Cordoba, but it's the same plan as what we've just seen. Now, when we look, go to Isfahan, we'll see this called Four Iwan, mosque, but, and then it has, there, there's one Iwan that has the Qibla on it. And then here is an example of a central plan mosque in Adirna. So the, these are the latest mosques to develop. Um, basically this chart just throw, shows you the three different kinds of mosques that we have. The central plan mosques are much later. This should say Umayyad, not Unayad. It's a misspell. It should, it should be an M. So the first group we're going to look at, these expanding groups, are the Umayyads. So we had the Abbasid dynasty that ruled the Muslim heartland, Arabia, the Middle East, but we also have Umayyads who control the West. And they built a capital in Cordoba, Spain, and they ruled there until 1031, so a long time. And this became a center for scholars, for scientists, for poets, for musicians. And so they, in this Spain became a center. There were Byzantine rulers that would come there, European rulers that would come from Germany and France, from, and then of course, Muslim rulers as well, as so they can come by the Mediterranean. So it was a very great learning center. This is the inside of the prayer hall in the great mosque at Cordoba in Spain, which is the capital of Islam in Spain. And so we see this endless forest of columns and arches that just extend into infinity. 
So the idea is this repetition. If you think back to the concept of walking around the Kaaba to undo time, again, we see this here, this idea of infinity. There's no hierarchy here at all. Here's another view of it. So this is the interior of the prayer hall, the inside of the hypostyle hall. So this great mosque is known as one of the finest surviving examples of Spanish Umayyad architecture, which is why we look at it here. They began it on a site of a Christian church, and interestingly, they recycled many of the columns from ruins of old classical buildings. So that's why you look at it and you say, huh, that was very innovative. They did take the horseshoe arch and modify it. This becomes very closely associated with Islamic architecture in the West, and it will become a keyhole arch, which you actually can even see in Christian architecture in the Southwestern United States. We have contrasting materials, which is decorative and functional, because the red, the red is bricks, which are more flexible, but the strength comes from stone. So it's made out of brick and stone put together. Now, their architecture is using horseshoe arches, which we see here. This horseshoe arch is a modification of the Roman arch, as you can see the roots of it, and also what they call an ogival arch or a pointed arch, and then different variation. So mucarnas are structurally squinches, and they use these mucarnas in their architecture. They, they're interlocking vaulting units. You can see a little bit of that structure here up above. You can see this um, horseshoe arch with these columns next to it and then how, the, how they're piled one onto the other. So here you can see this series of keyhole arches here. And this is built in the 10th century. So in, in the 10th century, at this great mosque, this new caliph commissioned a new mihrab. And so these ribbed domes, they're actually, they seem as though they're floating. And they put diagonal arches. You see that in the corners? So it provides this base. And Stockstead talks about this. Here's your page numbers for you. So let's compare. So if you look at the plan of this a mosque and a Christian basilica, it's interesting to think about the way they're used. So on the left, we have the great mosque in Cordoba, or you can think about the mosque that we saw from Tunisia. And then on the right, this is just a regular early basilica plan Christian church. So they're both like square boxes and they both have this courtyard in the front, whether it's a son or an atrium, it's the same thing. But in the basilica, we have these straight rows, you know, fewer columns. And because we have this nave in the center, we are moving the viewer's eye and the congregation itself. When you walk in, you move toward the apse, which is where the priest is, where the I, where the um, icon would be or the altarpiece or the cross or whatever image Christian imagery that there would be in there. So it's a longitudinal focus and that's where the clergy performs their rituals or teaches their servants. So the space in the basilica is determined by ritual and by the order of the ritual, if you will. So the worshipers are like the columns. They're, obe they're obedient to this longitudinal vista toward the apse. So that's what's going on here. You gather in the apron, you go in, you're an orderly file, and you follow this ceremony and by you know, very many complex steps. But in contrast, so in this great mosque, there's no longitudinal focus needed at all. We have this sun, which is a courtyard. There's usually a source of running water so they can do a purification ritual. All participate in ritual pur purification before they pray. And then inside the mosque, we have the Qibla wall up here, which orients you toward mat so you know which way to put your mat. Other than that, it just unifies the faithful. You just put your mat down and you pray. So we have, as we've seen, this endless repetition of columns, just like the worshipers who are united only in common prayer.
I want to show you the Palace of the Lions in Granada in Spain. It's actually an abbreviation of the Arabic Kalat al-Hamra, or Red Fort. It was built by the Nasrid dynasty, who were the last Muslims to rule in Spain. And this is a secular building. I thought I'd like to show you an 18th century illustration of it. So this is a watercolor done by an artist named John Frederick Lewis um, in somewhere around 1874. So this is what it looked like then. You can see the people there on the grand tour or something in their 18th century dress. But it gives you a really good sense of what it looked like. Here it is today. This is more contemporary. This is the outside of the Court of the Lions. So it's a little different because it's not a place for worship, but we do still, we have a fountain. We have these lions around it. We have the, the pointed arches and then these rows of columns doubled and then a single, doubled and then single. All of this beautiful tracery work. They created beautiful gardens and just luxurious palaces. And so I wanted you to see um, and this, of course, is more of a contemporary photograph, but these gardens have been preserved. So it's just a little tiny idea of how elaborate these gardens would have been. By the 11th century, power begins to come to independent regional rulers. And Islamic history, like any other history, is complex. And there's a rise and flow of empires this is a survey class, so I'm trying to give you a flavor of an overview rather than a, a whole history lesson on one dynasty or another. But like any other culture, the strength of an empire comes with whether the ruler himself is able to do centralized rule. So in the West, Umayyad Spain actually breaks up into small fragments. They're, they're at war. We've got the Crusaders coming into Spain, and we have a, we have a long war in, against the Christian armies and the Muslim armies that lasts into the 12th and 13th centuries. We have the Seljuks who take over Persia in 1038, who are patrons of the arts. So in later Islamic art, we don't have so much building happening in Spain we begin to focus more toward Persia and then out toward India. The Ottoman Empire comes into power in the 14th century and they replace the Seljuks in Anatolia, which is now Turkey. We've seen that from our map. The Ottoman Empire lasted all the way until 1918. They captured the Constantinople in 1453 and they ended the Byzantine Empire. So, we looked at the Hagia Sophia last time, and we talked about how the Hagia Sophia had become a mosque and how now it's a museum. So this mosque, you'll say, yes, that looks like the Hagia Sophia, doesn't it? Yeah, we've got these four minarets in this dome. This is the Selimiye Kami in Edirne in Turkey. It was designed by Sinan. Now, only royal mosques were permitted multiple minarets. So if you see a mosque that has four, you know it's a royal mosque. Uh, mosques that are for the everyday people would have one minaret, like that early mosque that we saw with the minaret at the end of the courtyard. This particular dome is 102 feet in diameter, and these minarets are almost 300 feet high. This is the inside, and it looks kind of like the Hagia Sophia, but it's a true central plan structure. So if you remember the Hagia Sophia, because it was built as a Christian church, had somewhat of a central plan, but it had that sort of egg shape and it was centered toward an apse. This mosque, of course, is not. We have a very small fountain in the middle that's covered by a muletzin, which is emphasizing its centrality. And then we have eight piers springing and then um, the arches are all supporting the dome and they're coming off these eight piers here. So we've got light every level. This is full of light. It's full of the endless light of God. Here's an example of Ottoman manuscript painting. So the Ottomans put this calligraphy to political use and they developed a design of interior imperial ciphers. They call them tugras. So we originate the art of calligraphy as a sacred writing, but 
throughout the centuries, it does become political and it symbolizes the authority of the Sultan. It serves as an endorsing mark on all official documents. So it's, if you think about your thumbprint on your iPhone, you know, these are security documents. If it isn't drawn with absolute perfection, then it, the document will not be official. So we see in these Tukaras a merging of abstraction and functionalism with adornment. So if you look very carefully at this, you can see these sort of naturalistic flora and fauna swirling around, but yet it's very abstracted as well. The next empire we're going to look at is the Mughal Empire, which pushed into India. This particular building is the Taj Mahal, which is actually a tomb. So Islam came to India in the 8th century, and they made just an incredible impression on all of Indian art, not just Islamic. Like artists everywhere, they used the materials that were there to hand, and they incorporated some native ability of the people that were there. So the Mughal architects did carved stone along with tile. They took this 300-year-old tradition of Islamic building with arches and domes and combined it with stone carving to make incredible structures. Here you can see that they're using the gardens, they're using the imagery in the water so that the Taj Mahal appears as though it's floating. And this is actually a mausoleum, it's not a mosque, but it does have an Iwan. This is an Iwan here. Each of these openings is called an Iwan. And we have two stories of smaller Iwans, so the whole thing feels as though it's absolutely unearthly. It's absolutely weightless. The entire building is embellished with relief carving. This is a mosque. This is what's called a four Iwan plan. And so followers of Islam in the East introduced this new plan for the mosque. So it's a large vaulted chamber. This one is in Iran. It's got a huge arched opening on one side, and here these Iwans are facing each other from across a courtyard, which has a pool of water in it, reflecting the Iwans, making space infinite, and it's decorated all over with blue and white tile. So here's a close-up of a mihrab from the Qibla wall in this Four Iwan mosque in Iran. And we see the use of the Kufic and the cursive script within the design of these organic and geometric shapes. So if you look around the outside, you can see that same type of marking that we saw on the pen box, and then all of the intricacies of the carving in the center, expanding forms, geometric forms. So the whole thing creates this sense of infinity. They made these by cutting each little piece of tile and laying them side by side in mortar. And most of the tile work from that time you see is this blue and white color. That's what they had for pigments. It's an incredible amount of work. Now, the last great dynasty that came out of Central Asia were the Timurids, and Timur settled in Samarkand in 1370, and he ended up subjugating all of Central Asia, greater Iran and Iraq, parts of Southern Russia, and the Indian subcontinent. So he was a conqueror, and he died in 1405. So the Timurids were short-lived, but this is an example of some of their artwork. This is a secular artwork from their time. Look at the naturalism in this. We get a really good idea of the way they were dressed, what their horses looked like. This is a hunting scene. This is an example of Timurid tile work. So this is from the 12th century Timurid Friday Mosque. It's a little bit different than the mosque we saw at Isfahan. It's a little bit more abstracted, a little bit more geometric, which is a hallmark of this Timurid tile work. And another Timurid painting, this is called Bahram Gur with the Indian princess. The scene is taking place at night, but again, we these are these secular scenes and these Timurid paintings, there's just so many of them. If you get a chance to look them up, do, because they're 
just wonderful in the way that they create abstracted spaces, the way that they're using pattern and color and luminosity. There's no shadows. There's We don't see chiaroscuro the way we do in Western art. We see the floor, pool, and platform and bed. They're tilted up. And we'll see some of this tilting idea in early medieval art, but it isn't quite as flat as this. I want to conclude just showing you some different art forms. This is some metal work. This is a griffin from Islamic Mediterranean, probably Fatimid Egypt, but not sure. It's from 11th century. It's 42 inches high, and it's made from cast bronze. So the Islamic artists were masters of glass blowing, of metal work, of jewelry. They were, they were master craftsmen, and we have all sorts, just too many different objects to be able to show you in one short lecture. Oftentimes we'll see animals inside medallions. You see them along the flanks of this creature here. And of course the bands across his chest, they're embellished with Kufic lettering. We've already seen this pen box, but I wanted to repeat it here toward the end of the lecture to sort of bring things together. These metal workers did take techniques from Roman artists, from Byzantine artists. So here's a piece that has got glass, metal, ivory. There were probably artisans that you know communicated different materials and techniques. You, there were status symbols as well as sacred objects. And here is a beautiful glass, hand-blown glass bottle from Syria. So there's enamel on the blown glass and gilding. This is 19 inches by nine, so it's tall. It's almost two feet high. So we have palaces, and then we have these portable objects. Glass making is an old, old art form, and I could spend an entire lecture just talking about glass, and in particular, Islamic glass, which is some of the most beautiful and incredible in the world. But we're going to have to be satisfied with this one example. They were very innovative in their application of decoration and the way in which they did it, but the art form is just superb. We can't leave this discussion without a mention of textiles. Again, Islamic and Persian carpets are a subject that are far too vast to give credit to. This is a carpet from 1540, and I have a slide. This is a, a silk textile with elephants and camels. We see Kufic inscriptions on it with good wishes for the patron. We've got woven silks of Sasanian Persia that are the technique that this is done with, and I've got a slide for you that show you some different ways. We really don't have very many carpets from before the 16th century. The oldest knotted carpets we have date back to the fourth and fifth century, and they've got designs that are actually su suggestive of Achaemenid Persia, but most Islamic carpets that we have in Persian carpets are ma were made by this knotting technique. So they, they, there's a warp and a weft, and then the pattern is knotted into it. And so many of them, they were just made in tents and in homes, but it was an incredible industry.